Okay, very good evening again. And we are continuing our series. I don't know for how long, but I'm going to take my time of uh, do business and be successful the Bible way until uh, I come. So we want to address everything that pertain to life and godliness. Advancing the kingdom is a family business. Uh, Jesus says I must be about my father's business. And um, if we understand these principles or these secrets, our minds are going to be renewed and we are going to have a victorious uh, a Christian life. Uh, so that's what we want to have, a victorious Christian life in every aspect uh, of uh, our life, not just uh, uh, so in marriage, in business, a secular business, in your career, in your studies, in every aspect of life, in your uh, bringing of the children, we are going to have a wholesome gospel. Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel, not just about healing. If we only preach on healing, we become a ministry, uh, but we are a church. And in the church, uh, there are ministries uh, that are uh, spearheaded by uh, Jesus Christ himself. In the church, there are gifts that are spearheaded by the Holy Spirit. And in the church, there are activities that are spearheaded by God uh, the Father. So that's all part of uh, the church. Uh, so if people expect me to preach on healing every time, that's not uh, the case. That's why we have a healing crusade, that's a ministry. We have a voice of healing, that's a, a ministry uh, within the house of prayer for all uh, nation so we need to fully understand it less people try to come on sunday every time for us to preach on healing we are not a ministry we are a church and uh, for that we need to teach in every aspect of life so secret number three secret number three it is the ability to transform ourselves from a, a caterpillar to a butterfly so the, the ability to transform ourselves from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So you can take another kind of transformation that you want, but I like uh, uh, the caterpillar to the butterfly. So that the ability, secret number three, the ability to transform ourselves from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So point number one metamorphosis. So we want to see the metamorphosis. Now the metamorphosis is a great change in appearance or in character. A great change in appearance or in character. That's a general thing. So uh, it is also a process uh, uh, that happens a lot in animal, in insects. We have a worm that turns into a wonderful uh, butterfly. So as a Christians, uh, we are supposed to be transformed. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, he says, I beseech you brethren. So I'm begging you to word the word, to, the verb to beseech is to beg. So to beg, please. So I beseech you, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. So we want a transformation of your spirit, soul, and body. That is the full gospel. Your spirit, soul, and body, and your immediate environment, and ultimately your extended uh, environment. So that's what we want your spirit, soul, and body, your immediate uh, environment, and your um, extended uh, environment. So by the mercies of God that you present your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We are not, men are not our standard. We are not trying to please men. We are trying to please God. We're trying to do what is acceptable to him, which is uh, your reasonable service or your reasonable worship. God is not asking us something that is unreasonable. Whatsoever God asks us to do, because he knows we can do it. So let's throw out of the window those excuses that I can do that I can't do it. If God is asking us something, it is he has the ability to allow us to fulfill what he commanded us to do. And do not be conformed 
uh, to this world. The world here to conform is to have the same mindset, the same behavior, the same character. So we don't want to have the same mindset that the world has. We don't want to have the, the mindset of uh, so many either unhealthy uh, mindsets that the world has. But we are not supposed to be like that. We are not Christians are supposed to think differently, to think in line with the written word of God. So don't be conformed to the world of this present age, but so be transformed. The word there is metamorpho, so from which we have uh, metamorphosis. Uh, so be transformed, just like a caterpillar becomes a uh, butterfly, so that's the word that is used here. Be transformed by how do you do that by the renewing of your mind? My job is to inform your mind, and once you have that information, your job is to move it from here up to your heart. And when you believe it in your heart, then you start speaking the, the same way and you start acting. Uh, in accordance with uh, the mind that has been renewed and what you've believed in your heart. And then you are going to be saved, to be fully transformed. What has happened here and here will result in the way you are going to talk, the way you are going to behave. That's why I will tell you a secret. In the book of Revelation, the number 666 is written on the forehead and on the palm of the hands of the people. So not that uh, maybe one day there, would, uh, there will be a literal uh, inscription or tattoo 666 six, six, and the chip in the people's hand, but let me tell you what the, what the spiritual meaning of that uh, number, that's the trinity of uh, man. 666, six, six, that was the number of the beast. We know that the world is under the sway of or the influence of the evil one, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And the Son of Man, God, Christ Jesus, has come to give us that understanding. So the devil wants to condition your mind. When your mind has been conditioned the wrong way, you are going to behave the wrong way. God also is uh, having a battle as well to condition your mind according to the word of God so that you can behave in an acceptable way. So both Satan and God, they are fighting for your mind. That's why the devil now wants to teach your children those perversion from a primary school when they still can mold the mind, where they easily believe everything. The beauty of bad children, they are innocent. They believe everything. So the same thing also, God also is fighting for your children. He wants you to teach them at home because if you put the right information in the mind of your children, they will believe it in the heart and they will behave like that. And Satan also says, okay, let me deceive you. It, is a, it takes a, a whole village to raise a child. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says the parents, they raise the children not the community, not the village. So don't be conformed to the world because what they after, they want to put a 666 on the mind of your children. They want to put a trinity of uh, uh, mankind so that they will behave like the devil at the end with a perversion. So that's why you have a TV, you have a radio to enter those two spiritual gates, the eyes and the ears to pollute what is in the mind. And if you pollute what is in the mind, then they are going to behave uh, differently because they would believe that lie. And if you believe a lie, you empower the liar, Satan. But if you believe the truth, the truth will set you free in the name of Jesus. So that you are going to be transformed from a wormy uh, person or a caterpillar kind of person to a butterfly beautiful kind of person by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that renewing of the mind is done by the washing of the word by the word of God. So Philip, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 says that he uh, might is sanctified. So Christ is going to sanctify uh, and cleanse her, meaning the church, with the washing of the water by the word. So it is the washing of the water that is going to cleanse uh, the church, cleanse the individuals within the church to make them holy. Jesus says in his prayer, 
in uh, John chapter 17, sanctified and set them apart by your word. Your word is the truth. Everything has to do with the word of God. And a wordless church is a powerless church. Brother Jay, why do you insist on the word of God? Because without the word of God, there is no power. I'm not ashamed. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believe, uh, believes for the Jews first, but also for the Gentiles. If you have the same understanding that the Jewish or Christian had, you are going to have also the same power. And people already say, Brother Jerry, just teach us scriptures on the healing. It won't work. Because if your mind is not renewed, think of healing like uh, your stove, electric um, cooker, for instance, or your um, iron, or your kettle that has a resistance to create the heat. Well, if there is no electricity coming into your house, forget about that iron working, forget about that uh, electric cooker uh, uh, heating, forget about uh, that electric radiator uh, heating the, the, the room either. You first of all need to have a wiring in your house. You need to have uh, uh, the electricity coming into the house before you can transform it into any other usage you want to, to make of it. So there are some basic things, some basic ways of thinking that we are supposed to have if we want uh, the power of God to flow effortlessly in every aspect of life. So once you have those principles, you are going to be able to convert that uh, energy into any kind of, uh, that, uh, into any kind of uh, output. You can transfer, uh, to turn it into uh, a light, it's the same electricity that came into your house. You can transform it into heat in your kettle, in your electric radiator. You can you can do anything. You can uh, turn it into, uh, uh, into ice the, when it goes through your, your 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 refrigerator. But you need first of all to have those basic uh, things, and it is going to be uh, applicable in every aspect of life. When I read a book on marriage, I see healing. <laughs> when I read a book on finance, I see healing. Though it is titled, the marriage is titled finances, because it is the same principles that you are going to apply in between healing, in deliverance, in marriage. And the word of God is like uh, um, the embryonic cells. They will take the form of any organ at the end. They will take the form of any bone. So it is like a seed. And uh, all the DNA is packaged inside it. So if you, if, if you, if as the, the person grows, he wants, God is now the, 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 that, that fetus, is the, 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 an eye is uh, to be formed. It was still in that embryonic uh, cell that is going to turn into an eye, a uh, cell in the eye, uh, a heart, uh, a lung. In Jesus, a precious name. Or can just turn into skin. So that's how the word of God is. So don't try to, to see only that in, um, in healing, in uh, deliverance, in marriage, in finances, it applies in every aspect of our Christian life. Our mind needs to be renewed. So the way we go through that metaphor, uh, meta, uh, metamorphosis is by entering into a cocoon. So we wait upon the Lord in a cocoon. In, in a cocoon. So a cocoon uh, is a silky uh, case spun by uh, larva uh, of many insects. So they would build that cocoon, that sil silky case, and they would wait inside. So you and I also, we need to be cocooned in our secret place where we wait upon the Lord in prayer, 
in fasting, but mainly in the reading of the word of God. If your prayer and your fasting does not have the word of God, there will be no transformation. The fuel that you uh, are using or the wood is the word of God. So the prayer and the fasting that are worthless if there is no studying of the word of God. I told you already the way Ezra, uh, they fasted in the days. They fasted from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And for one third of the, the time, they praised the Lord. For one third of the time, they uh, read the word of God. And for one third, they prayed. So divide 12 by three. And then... Uh, uh, four hours they will praise the Lord, four hours they read the word of God, and four hours they prayed. So the word, the, the three piece, like I told you, your quiet time needs to have the word of God if you want a transformation. Religion, religious people like to pray, but they don't like the word of God. Some churches, they pray, 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 pray all night, vigil all the time, but you see the way they are behaving, they are even sometimes worse than pagans. Why? Why are they not transformed? Though they are doing all the praying, they will do 100 day fast, 40 days fast. Every January is a competition, but they are, when you see them, they are very carnal. The word, it is the word that transforms, not the prayer and the fasting. If you don't have wood, you cannot have any fire going. You have a big flame, you put some kerosene, light the match, that's the praying in tongues, as I've explained in the voice of healing already, on the, the, you are the light of the world. But if there is no oil, if there is no uh, wood, then your prayer and your fasting are pointless. It will not result into any transformation. So in that cocoon, we are waiting upon the Lord in that secret place where we've cocooned ourselves with the word of God, prayer, and with fasting. And God is able to speak to us. And when we are in that presence of the Lord, what God does is that his presence melts uh, us away. Hallelujah. God is a consuming fire. And he will not just consume our enemy, he will also consume us. Whatever is not of his, he's going to consume it by fire. So just like also a caterpillar, when it is inside that cocoon, it melts. The Bible tells us in Psalm 97 verse 5, Psalm 97 verse 5, it says, the mountain melts like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of the all earth. So just like uh, mount, uh, uh, wax before fire melts down, so also when we are cocooned in the presence of the Lord, through the word of God, through prayer, through fasting, we don't fast all the time. So many times we just go to pray. Whenever Moses went on the mountain, you did not go all the time to fast, okay? So get away from the kind of mindset that every time Moses went on the mountain, he was to fast. No, you went to wait upon the Lord. So, Though it involves sometimes fasting, but it's not all the time that Moses was uh, fasting either, okay? But when we're in the presence of the Lord, because it's a consuming fire, we are in that secret place, in that cocoon, just like also the caterpillar will be melting inside that cocoon. Uh, you also, in the presence of the Lord, you are going to melt uh, down. Whatever is ugly in your life, whatever is ugly in my life that doesn't conform, to the image of Christ Jesus, Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we are all predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. So whatever is uh, not conforming to the image of Christ Jesus is going to be melted uh, away like wax before fire in the presence of the Lord in the secret place where we are cocooned uh, in the, uh, before the Lord. And what God is going to do also is going to give us now a new shape. It's going to shape us into the image of Christ. So that when we come out, we come out like a butterfly, beautiful. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3 to verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3 to verse 6. It says, Then I went down to the porter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. 
and uh, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in uh, the hand of the porter. So he made it again into another vessel. So he made it, he did not like the shape of it, he crushed it. So that's what God is going to do in that secret place. He will make it, he doesn't like it, he will crush it again and again. So the quicker you comply with God, the easier the process is going to be. The more you and I are stubborn and stiff-necked and are not willing to be molded by God in the secret place, we can waste the 40 years of our life in the wilderness. We are having motions, but no progress. We are going around in a circle. That's why lots of Christians, you see them tomorrow, they are still the same. They have not changed. They are still going around the same mountain. So, he said, so, he, um, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the porters to make. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this porter, says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the porter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So God wants to mold us. So inside that cocoon, uh, the Lord is going to mold you and I. In his presence, we are going to melt away like wax before fire. Whatsoever is not conformed to the image of Christ, whatever is conformed to the image of the world, the character, the behavior, the mindset, they are all going to melt away in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And then what is going to happen when we are going to come out of that cocoon? We are going to be radiant like a butterfly. Our face is going to shine in the name of Jesus. Exodus chapter 34, verse 33 to verse 35. Exodus chapter 34, verse 33 to verse 35. The Bible says, and when Moses had finished speaking with them, the Bible says uh, he put a veil uh, on his face. So Moses was in the presence of the Lord on the mountain. God is going to deal with you. That's why things are going to melt away from your life. And you are going to be more and more like Christ. When Moses, Moses became the meekest man on the face uh, of the earth. Hallelujah. God is going to mold you to, so that you will have his character. You would have power, but we meekness is power under control. We have so much power, so tremendous power, yet you are able to not abuse the power. Even when they insult you, you can curse them and the earth would split open and send all of them to hell, but you are still able to control yourself. The problem is not with the power. God has all the power. The problem is a lot of us are not conformed to the image of Christ. And if God gave us the power, we would want all of our enemies to die. But God does not trust us. We limit the Holy One of Israel because we don't go through the process of transformation. So the Bible says, he finished the, his meeting with the Lord. He was there for 14 days and 49. So he came down, he spoke to the people the word of God, but to Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And verse 35, and whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that face, that the skin of Moses' face shone. Then Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. So every time Moses went in the presence of the Lord, he would cocoon himself. And if you read Exodus chapter 34, the Bible says Moses was there five days on the mountain and then the cloud came and overshadowed Moses. He swallowed up Moses. Hallelujah. He was cocooned. In the presence of the Lord, a bright cloud came and God was melting whatsoever was not of his in the life of Moses. So remember also in the mountain of transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 or Mark chapter 9, Jesus also was on the mountain of transfiguration. He called his friends, Peter, John and James to come with him and then 
Moses and Elijah appeared to him. And then the Bible says a bright cloud came and overshadowed Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. The, the three of them were cocooned. Hallelujah. So God in his presence is going to cocoon you. Hallelujah. And melt away anything that does not glorify his name, anything that is conformed to the world. When you see a pastor that is very worldly, he does not have a secret place. When you see a man that is always angry, he does not have a secret place with the Lord. Because God would have dealt with those issues. So when they would have come out, he would be smiling, radiant, gentle like a dove. Hallelujah. You can know already when a person's a secret place is, uh, is now non-existent. They're based on his behavior. It is not when the pastor or a person falls into adultery or steals the money of the church that, that that's when the problem started. The problem started long ago when he stopped having the secret place with God. And every time Moses lingered on the, with the men on the on the at the feet of the mountain, the glory was departing, the face was no longer shining, and then he would go again, remove the veil, spend time with the Lord face to face. As a man speaks to his friend, his face will shine again. As you spend time with the Lord, you are going to shine. People are going to see Jesus for you in the name of Jesus. Point number two. Point number two. You no longer see yourself as a grasshopper, but as a giant killer. Point number two, when your mind is transformed, you no longer see yourself as a grasshopper, but as a giant killer. Now, we know in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 33, the Bible says that the 10 spies that went uh, at the instruction of Moses to spy out the land, to scout the land, the, the land, came back with this report. They said, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak uh, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They had a low self-esteem. They sold themselves as insignificant in the land. So when your mind is not renewed, you are going to define yourself the way people see you. you are, they were a bunch of slaves. And though they came out of the of slavery, but slavery was still in them. A lot of us, we've been delivered from fornication, but uh, fornication is still in us. We've been delivered from homelessness, but uh, the mentality of a homeless is still in us. We've been delivered uh, from uh, Bankruptcy, but the mentality of bankruptcy is in us. We've been delivered from poverty, uh, but the mentality of poverty is still in us. And we, God can't do anything unless our mind is renewed. That's the problem that people have. They come to church, whatever the problem was, if it was immigration, they come to church. The moment they are, they are delivered, they run away. Okay, they come to church the moment they are married, they run away. They had that little deliverance life for them. It was a deliverance from slavery. But it takes time to renew the mind. You need to sit and be taught so that you are going to renew your mind. If you keep on running from God after you got your deliverance, then you are going to go around that same mountain for 40 years because your mind is not renewed. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is a he or she. Now we need to move from that kind of mindset to a mindset where we no longer see ourselves as grasshoppers. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, Isaiah 41 verse 10 tells us, fear not, I am with you. So God is saying to you, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I told you the word uh, dismayed is to be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by the size of your problem. Your background does not define uh, your future. The fact that they were a bunch of slaves uh, does not define what the future was. So the enemy may label you uh, with uh, names, but 
Have you received the labeling of the Lord? What is God saying about you in his Bible? That's why we teach the word of God so that you may know what God says about you. And if you don't renew your mind, then in every, if it be it in business, when you are going to do a business, you are going to, to say, well, okay, before I came to, so let me finish this one. Do not be intimidated or dismayed for I am with you. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. You will help you. And I will uphold you with my right, my righteous right hand. And God continues and says in the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15, he says, behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. So all the nations of the world, they are just like a drop in the bucket. Back home, sometimes we used to have those buckets of uh, 12 liters or 10 liters to fetch water. And God says, uh, all the nations of the earth in his eyes, they are just like a, a drop of water in the book, in a bucket and are counted as uh, the small dust on the scale. So you put, you have a scale, is it just like a small dust? You've not even put a weight or meat on the scale, just like the dust that is on the scale, it is insignificant. Look and lift up the, uh, the eyes as a, a very little thing. So even an island, you will lift it up just like he lifts up the eyes, like a, a very little thing. So whatever, even if you are thinking about from Cairo, God is speaking to you that he's going to give, like he spoke to Ryan Abangi from Cape Town to Cairo, he's going to give him those uh, nations, he's going to preach the gospel and win millions of souls for God. He just, if he gave you a, a, a drop of water in a bucket, not even a full cup for him, all those nations, just, just like a drop of water in a bucket, insignificant. So that's how insignificant it is to God. So you are seeing, oh, has not Ryan Abanke led 78 million souls to Christ before he went to glory? Yes, he has done it. Because in the eyes of God, it was just like a drop of water in the bucket for him to give him all those souls. And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, you jump from 15, you go to verse 22. Bible says, Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says, it is he, God, who sits above the circle of the earth. So when the pagan were still thinking that the earth was uh, flat, Isaiah the prophet already saw that it would, there, there were circles. So like a sphere, galaxies are spirals. So if you read your Bible, you will know a lot of science. Because God who created did not say the earth was flat or the universe was flat. He said there were circles. And God sits above all those galaxies. And all the inhabitants of the earth, they are like grasshoppers. So from the perspective of God, that sits above all those circles of the earth, uh, they are just, they are, the inhabitants are just like grasshoppers. And you and I, we are seated in the heavenly place. We need to see things from God's perspective. Whatever giant you think your problem is, in the eyes of God, they are just like grasshoppers. And you are seated at the right hand of Jesus. You should see them also as uh, grasshoppers. And he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. The scientists discovered that the, the universe is expanding. Well, they should have asked Isaiah. God said he was expanding the universe. He was stretching those circles like a curtain, like you pull a curtain, the entropy. When I read my Bible, I see science, I see physics, I see genetics. That's how my father taught me the Bible, and that's how the Jews see the Bible. There are always the three layers in the Bible. There's the spiritual, there's the natural, there's the scientific. There's a medical aspect to it. May God open your eyes to see the science, the medicine, the technology behind the, the word of God. So God already was saying he's, the, universe, the universe is expanding. So when they tell the universe is expanding, the Bible leaves the wrong. I say, let me show you the Bible where it is right. You just discovered it yesterday. Let me show you where it is already now. The prophet Isaiah already said it. So he spread them out like a tent 
to dwell in. So you need to see, instead of the enemy, you seeing yourself as a grasshopper, see the enemy like the grasshopper because you are seated in the heavenly places. And from God's perspective, all the inhabitants of the earth are just like a grasshopper, uh, hoppers. So when your mind is not renewed like that, even if you want to do business, you are going to already disqualify yourself. Well, Brother Jerry has been talking about chapati all the time here, like uh, David wanted to drink the water from Bethlehem. And then someone, the world water where he was, but he wanted to drink the water from Bethlehem. And I will continue to repeat it until one of you get it. He did not say you are the one that is supposed to do that. God has a will, he has a plan. Anyone that will jump in that water will receive it. Just like the pool of Bethesda. There is no name of a person written on that project. God just has that desire. David had the desire to drink the water from the well that is in Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was under a siege. So two of his uh, men looked at each other well. Let us go and take the, fetch the water for David. They went and fetched the water. They brought it uh, to David. So if you have a grasshopper mentality and your mind has not been renewed, when now God even asks you to do a business, you are going to say, well, maybe I should just be doing chapatis and wait for when all the Kenyans start doing the, the, the parties. I'm going to be supplying the Kenyans uh, uh, that are doing the party, the chapatis. Or if you think maybe uh, in the better way, to, okay, got some African shops, okay. Let me also make some chapatis and deliver them to African shop because you are thinking like a grasshopper. I had to, these are the things that I had to teach Esther to renew a mind. I said, you need to see yourself taking the whole of the UK with a light and clinical. You need to see yourself being an NHS, supplying them with nurses and GPs. And today, a light and clinical, they are in, uh, in uh, England, in Scotland, in uh, Wales. I don't, they are not in Ireland yet. I told you, you need to change the way you are thinking. Well, I'm a black person. That's, you are thinking like a grasshopper. I always pull the ears of my Nigerian friend. I say, jollof rice is very good. Why don't I see that in Asda? Because you have a grasshopper mentality that nobody is going to eat my jollof rice. Why do they eat the Chinese uh, rice uh, in Asda? They sell it uh, in, uh, uh, in those parks, you can buy it. Why do they sell the pillow rice uh, of the East African, uh, so East um, Middle East in, in Asda? You need to see big, you need to see conquering the whole of uh, the nation. When I was starting with Sister Lisa Tse and uh, Helen Tse, the Chinese uh, sisters, I told them that the little sauce that you only serve in your restaurant, the family restaurant, we want to make to take it uh, nationwide and international. So I, I, as we were studying the Bible, every Thursday was the Bible study in the, in the office of um, um, Helen, that was the lawyer. I was also testing the sauce and God gave us ideas how to do it. We started with Asda and then Tesco. Today we are in all the supermarkets with the source of, uh, of the UK and we are exporting in 26 countries. Now the source that is made here in uh, the Manchester is now being sold in China mainland because they've done something that was not done before. They've uh, removed the nuts because people are allergic to nuts, so they've put some chemicals so that it will taste like nuts, but it is not nuts. They've removed the sugar, so that people with diabetes can have that kind of a thing. So the queen gave her MBE for that uh, kind of wonderful thing. They did a movie for the, for the, about the family in uh, Hong Kong, where they came from. Whenever the prior, the primary of China comes, they always uh, invited at 10, uh, Downing, uh, the Buckingham, 10 Downing Street to cook for the premier as a pride of Great Britain. And when they wrote the wonderful book, they say, thank you, Pastor Jerry Malanda. 
Your mind needs to be renewed. Stop seeing yourself as a grasshopper. Conquer the world. And if your mind is not renewed, it really does not matter what they are going to say to you. You are going to see yourself as a grasshopper. When the Lord actually speak to me about being on TV and where Benny Hinn was preaching, he said to me, you are going to preach healing as well. You are going to fill up stadium. And I said that to my friend. He said, no, these are for big, big people, not for people like you. He had a grasshopper mentality. And he said to me, no, filling stadiums in, the, in Europe, no, that's not possible. God is saying, actually, it is all the churches come together. Each one of them, when they will put all those uh, people together, it will be the size of a stadium, but not you yourself standing, and then the whole stadium is, is full. Don't you even see, even when a boy comes, he never, he's not even able to fill a stadium. Even when he goes to London, he only can fill a place of 40,000. So who are you? And English is not even your first language. The God says, stop sharing anything with him anymore. He has a grasshopper mentality. He's like those 12 spies. He will come and discourage your heart. Be careful with whom you are sharing your vision. And I did not say anything to him for 10 years. I can keep secrets for 10 years. I'm eating with you every day, but I will not tell you anything that God is saying. When I know that you have a mentality of a grasshopper and you want to pull me down, so renew your mind. Think the way God thinks. And you are going to have the result. It takes time to renew the mind. So God wanted to lead them by, uh, uh, there was a shorter path to go to the promised land. But really it was, did not matter. If the mind was not renewed, then they are going to be defeated. And there are going to be so many casualties though they were delivered. So for one year and nine months, one year and nine months, Moses was teaching every night so that the mind is going to be renewed. So after one year and nine months, God said, go possess the land and look at those worthless 10 spies that come with an evil report that we were grasshoppers. The report of the majority does not mean it is the report of the Lord. The whole congregation can say uh, something based on fear, but only Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit that believed the report of the Lord. So if you go with the masses, and especially the masses, they have, uh, they are conformed to the world, you are going to miss your promised land and go in circles for 40 years in the name of uh, Jesus. But that will not be your portion in the name of uh, Jesus. So my prayer that you are going to renew your mind in the name of Jesus. Because God, whatsoever your background is, whether you were slaves, like those bunch of slaves that he delivered from Egypt, whether you used to be a homeless, you used to be in addiction, you used to be uh, in prostitution, whatever was your past, God has a bright future for you and your children. He wants to give you houses. Oh, can the homeless have a house? Yes! The enemy will tell you that what you can aim for is maybe just have uh, uh, Government, accommodation, government accommodation. You know your past. You yourself. You are a former slave. Don't don't think even high. It is not for you. You never even have any education. Don't even try. And that's how also the social system thinks about those who used to be in drug addiction, homeless. They they just believe that they will amount to nothing in life. God is seeing great things about you. He took a bunch of slaves. He said, then listen to me. If you renew your mind the way I'm trying to, to, to renew your mind, I'm going to give you houses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 to verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 to 11. He says, so it shall come to pass when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and beautiful city which uh, you did not build. Houses, hallelujah, full of all good things which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are full, then beware, verse 12, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he wants to give them business. He wants to. In when we go to Ukraine, somebody at Elijah that was the, with the, the, um, the embassy of Christ, 
he started the church in Ukraine. Uh, he took the drug addicts, the homeless, the drunkards, cleaned them up, sent some of them to school. They started businesses. Today, many of them are mayors of cities. They are MPs. They are businessmen. When you renew the mind of people, they now see the possibilities. God never makes a failure. Don't see yourself as a grasshopper. In the name of uh, Jesus. So your past does not define what your future is. Your future is based on the way you choose to renew your mind. Point number three. Point number three, don't play the victim. Hallelujah, we say it again. Do not play the victim. These things that I'm teaching you, the Jews were taught them. Uh, they, they, these things were told. That's what God said to them. They told me, you need to teach them to your children because things are going to happen in life. The tragedies are going to happen in life. But how do you overcome your, your past? The Jews, the new generation that, that came into the promised land that did not think like they were victims, they possessed the land. The fathers, because they refused to renew their mind, they died in the wilderness. Was it the plan of God for them to die in the wilderness? No. No, it was not. When I discovered it only took one year and nine months in the plan of God for them to renew their mind and possess the land, I wept. I said, God, I've been doing that for 10 years. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? We are behind schedule. In the plan of God. <laughs> I remember praying a prayer to God. I said, God, drag me. Uh, drag me. Even if I'm crazy, screaming, I don't want to waste my time. Because I know your plan was one year and nine months. And they turned that into 40 years. And after that, into, from 2007 to 2022, God, have mercy on Jerry. Because God will not force us. We need to comply with him. We need to comply with him. And if you're only a Sunday Christian, it's going to take you longer to renew your mind. <laughs> there are no shortcuts. The reason why Lynn and Kelvin are walking in sign and wonders because they've read all those uh, uh, my weekly week diligently again and again and again and again. When I when I met them, I said to them, read the, the those uh, Bible studies and record them. They looked at them. There were so many, but they did not know what is go effortlessly, because they will receive basically the same thing that is in my mind is going to be in the mind. They will not have to waste ten years to waiting upon the Lord. That's the job of Moses. But they can just receive it for free and run with it. There are no shortcuts. The mind is very important. So you can complain, God give me a gift. It doesn't happen like that. Your mind needs to be renewed. Otherwise, you are going to think like a grasshopper. And the worst thing is to think as a victim. They were slaves in Egypt. God is not making light of all the atrocities that they went through and experience in Egypt is not making light of any of that. And whatever trauma you went through, whatever tragedy uh, you experienced in your past, God is not making the light of it. I need to emphasize on that. But if you want to make progress in life and not waste 40 years, if you just to waste 40 years in the wilderness or refuse to change, want to play the victim, God is going to supply for you, but join the bare minimum. But as you are living below the potential that is trapped inside you, greatness is inside you. You have this treasure in that earthen vessel. You are going to live far below the potential that God has for you in every aspect of life. You had a bad marriage, yes, but life does not end. So don't see yourself as a victim. Whatever you happen, don't see yourself as a victim. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39, 
God did not speak into the new generation. Because the father, they say that they were victims. So God did not speak into the new generation. Don't be like your father that saw themselves as a victim. That's why let me, uh, I don't believe in the Me Too movement. Because it is not uh, biblical. It is a victim mentality. Are there injustices? Yes. We confront things like Martin Luther confronted things and according to the book of Amos, righteousness must run like, like, like a mighty stream. We confronted the injustice, but we are not playing the victim here. Anyone that comes with a victim mentality will not uh, progress in life in every aspect of life. So he says, moreover, your little uh, ones and your children, who you say, the father, you say will be victims who today have no knowledge of good and evil. So God had to wait for a new generation to be born that had not experienced slavery, that were born in the wilderness, so that he can mold the mind now for 40, and God even refused to circumcise them for 40 years. So those that were 20 and above, all of them are going to die. So that you don't pollute this new generation. Anyone that always speaks about victim mentality, I, I am not the friend. I am, and I cannot be your friend. But that is not uh, the Bible way. So if you teach your children to see themselves as a victim in the society, guess what? You are limiting. The, the only thing that they are going to see is the background. Oh, I am Indian. Today, he's not the son of an Indian uh, prime minister in the Republic of Ireland. He's not the son of an Indian also that is uh, taking, uh, how do you call it, um, that is almost about to become the prime minister of Great Britain. So, Boris Johnson is a father. He's from, uh, how do you call it, um, from Turkey. But he's a Turkish. His father was a journalist, a political journalist, and fled persecution. He was a refugee, political refugee. So you also a political, uh, whatever refugee you came uh, with your status here. What is the difference between a refugee from Turkey and a refugee from Nigeria, from Congo, and so on and so forth? You have a victim mentality. And all that you are seeing is your skin color. Just like in those days, the black were the Egyptians and they were ruling the world. So all that they were seeing was their skin color. When Moses married an Ethiopian, a black woman, they said, okay, you see, you are now also fraternizing with those black people. It has nothing to do with your skin color. It has nothing to do with your, your origin. That's why God built Israel as a nation with all kinds of skin color. There are white Jews, there are brown Jews, there are yellow Jews, there are uh, black Jews. It was never about uh, the skin color. It was about you serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that has no favorite. If you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus, you're going to limit the Holy One of Israel. You're going to think like a chicken instead of soaring like an eagle. You're going to remain a caterpillar instead of going through the transformation process and come out a butterfly. In Jesus' name. So God had to wait for that generation to die. And I pray that you are going to rise up. No, my father was a drunkard in drug addiction myself. No, there's hope for you now that you're in Christ Jesus. Don't define yourself based on that. God has a bigger purpose for you in Jesus' name. So God said to them, don't play the victim. I'm not ignoring your pain, but don't play the victim. Otherwise, you are going to delay my plans for your life. He says to them also, not just don't play the victim, don't see yourself as a victim, but also don't hate 
those who oppressed you. Don't hate those who did not help you. Many times we blame everybody. Nobody helped me. Now, he said to them, Deuteronomy chapter 23. So he's speaking to the new generation, the new that are going to enter the land. I'm speaking to you also, just like Moses. Moses said, I'm not going to make it. With your fathers, we're not going to make it. I tried my best to renew their mind, but they had the stones in the heads. Stiff necked. To be stiff necked is to be stubborn. They will not let God mold them. Like a potter will be molding, like Sister Beatrice, she, she does some pottery, molding clay. They will not allow God to do that. And that's what we read in Jeremiah 18. If I'm God, can I not mold you like the potter is molding the clay? Why don't you want me to mold your way of thinking, of seeing things, and doing things? So Moses is not speaking to a new generation. Listen, you have greater potential. Don't be like your fathers. One, don't play the victim, I told you already. You are going to make it to the promised land. And two, don't hate those who persecuted you in Egypt, those who enslaved you. Don't hate your brothers who did not help you, but even fought you. He says, the Trump chapter 23, verse 7, you shall not detest. I'm reading from the Amplified to, to abhor is to detest, to hate with passion. So the new king just said, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is a brother. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau that were living in the land of um, Seir of Edom. And uh, when Israel came out, so they are the, the brother of Jacob, Esau and uh, Jacob. So when Israel came out, instead of helping the brother, oh, sorry, you've been slaves for 430 years, let us help you. No. In fact, they came out and they fought the descendants of Esau. They hated, uh, especially Amalek. Not all of them. That's why God says in Malachi, I hate uh, Esau. Um, but Jacob have love. Is it not, not all of the children of Esau, but especially Amalek. Amalek thought that his father was weak to reconcile with uh, his uncle, his brother Jacob. So he decided to take matters in his own hand to put stumbling block, ambushment, and uh, kill uh, the Israelites. So God said I would have war with Amalek forever. So we're not talking about the Edomite here. We're not talking about all the Edomites. We're talking about Amalek. So don't even hate Amalek. Our brother did not like, uh, like me. That's also Joseph also was, uh, God told to Joseph, don't hate your brother. Though they sold you to slavery, they tried to kill you. Don't hate them. If you have a hatred based on what people did, God can't use you. So you should not hate or abhor or detest the Edomites for he is your brother. No matter what they've done. Oh, I've Christian have caused me to sleep in the street of Glasgow to eat out of the rubbish dump. And, but I know what are the spiritual implications. All those things that they did, it Satan did for them. It was so that I will have bitterness and uh, anger and hatred in my heart. But if I'm still bitter, I'm like the wormwood. The wormwood is uh, bitter. And I have no transformation. But I have a choice either to remain that wormwood that is bitter and hating everybody or to go inside the cocoon and let God melt away that uh, bitterness and that hatred due to the way people treated me and come out sweet on the other side. So there's no room. So he says, you shall not also abhor or hate with passion the Egyptians because you were an alien or a slave in the land. May you renew your mind. So he's saying to the children here, there's no reparation. What the Me Too movement is saying, reparation. So the, Ameri the white American should uh, pay back the, the, uh, the, the American Indian. The children that are here today, Ezekiel 18, they should not be held accountable for the sins of the fathers. Everyone is responsible for his own sin. Should they have a, bed, a, a just system where they would help 
some uh, reservation, yes. What they would help some Aborigin in Australia, yes. What they would help some black communities uh, to, to have a leg on the society, yes. But there is no such a thing as a reparation guilting uh, the new generation, the children of the Egyptians because of what the father did. That's not the word of God. And if some of the Africans that are lazy people waiting for a handout always, they are looking for reparation for colonization. Britain was colonized by uh, Rome. The first king, his name was Arturius. His mother, I think only his mother was English and his uh, father was uh, uh, Romans. We were a colony of Rome. Are we, Brit are we asking for reparation of, uh, from Rome to give us some money? France was a colony of Rome. Italy, Spain, are they asking uh, uh, reparation money from, uh, from uh, Italy? Before that, Greece, Italy and Rome was a colony of Greece. When the Greece Empire fell, they became the Roman Empire that conquered all of Europe. Are they, is Italy asking a reparation from uh, Greece? What will they get from Greece? Greece that is even in bankruptcy, that all, all of Europe is helping the Greece. Because they refuse to see themselves as victims. If you don't see yourself as a victim, then you are going to be able to work and come out of that uh, situation and even become stronger than uh, those who colonized you, those who used to oppress you. Look at Egypt today and Israel today. How God has exalted Israel. If you don't play the, the Irish, the Welsh that, and the Scots that left here because they were persecuted for the Christian and then Protestant faith and went to America to start a new land that they are going to use the faith. They did not play the victim that did not love us in America, in, in England. That's why they chased us. They persecuted. They did not play the victim. They went there in the world. Today, America is uh, greater and stronger than uh, Great Britain where the ancestors came. The prisoners, Australia used to be a prison. So when you served your sentence in uh, Great Britain as a prisoner, you could not get any employment. So they said, do you want to restart life? where we have uh, land there in Australia. So all of the people that you see, not the, the new one, the original one that they sent there from England and where they were for ex cons They did not uh, sit down, oh, we are just worthless prisoners. They worked and they built Australia. If you play the victim, and that's what God taught Israel. And every time they went through atrocity, they rebuilt. When they came back from Babylon, they rebuilt. When even after the Holocaust, in less than, uh, from 1946, they gave them in, in the, the independ independence. They become richer than all the Arab nations around them, Israel. Why the Palestinians are always playing the victim are starving. Is it the same land? The same number of uh, volume of rain falls on the same land, but one is exporting food all over the world, and one is uh, living by international aid, 300 million uh, every year that is given uh, to them by America so that the Palestinians can eat. And this is not asking for a handout. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And God told those things to his people, say, if you see, no matter what the tragedy you have gone through, if you refuse to see yourself as a victim, if you refuse to live in hatred, you choose to forgive, then I'm going to help you tremendously. And the way God makes it is that those who used to oppress you, you are going to rule over them. The brothers of uh, Jacob, Joseph became and bowed before him. When you know God, that's why so many times I just smile. When I see the way people are behaving, towards me, I just smile. And I don't even take offense anymore. Now that I know the ways of God, I'm going to be far above all of them in Jesus' name. When I arrived in uh, France, 
for the first year in my unit. And uh, some of my, I was in the Northeast World National Party, which is the Nazi party always wins. So racist folks are espoused in that place. So one of my, one of the, the colleagues, they were making jokes about my accent. Who cares about your accent? They said to me, no, you don't speak like, um, oh, you speak like someone from Belgium. I said, okay, no problem. And then one of them came, oh, when you came down from at the airport, that's when they cut your tail. I just laughed because I know who I am. I'm creating the image of God. And so is everyone creating the image of God. Anyone that says those kind of things, they don't know God. And if you take an offense because of this, it means that you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus. And I say to them, I'm going to be number one in this university in the name of Jesus. And you can take number two, number three. And that's how it happened in the name of Jesus. After the first semester, all of them kept quiet. And I was, they came, I was teaching them those disciplines where they can pass. And the same guy that said that uh, when I landed at uh, Rossi Shah the Gold, that's when they cut my tail. I was not teaching him <laughs> electrodynamics, uh, uh, mechanics, so that he can pass. Be above your critics. Be the bigger person in the name of uh, just because you know your identity in Christ. So that's how we live our life because our mind is uh, renewed. When I did my first placement in uh, the railway company SNCF, I was the first black that was in that uh, unit. And when I arrived the unit, uh, when I went to the, uh, they showed me the unit. And I went to the toilet with the director of the unit of production. There were Nazi crosses in the toilet. The day I arrived is the day they painted those toilets because there were still Nazi crosses in the toilets. I did not care. I did my work. And uh, they would sometimes uh, cause the train to, to break down to see if I was intelligent. On purpose, they would remove and unplug some cables. So I would tell them, show me the... the the maps and I say, okay, if you say this is worth behaving this way, so it means that uh, there is a disconnection here. They will look at one another, they will just be smiling. <laughs> and then there was one gay man, uh, homosexual guy, and he would, he, would, he would come and tell you, actually, they unplugged the cable, they just wanted to see uh, if you knew <laughs> what you were doing. And after that, uh, they became quite, I trained all of them in the new train, that, the Canadian train that they received, the Bombardier Z2000, uh, 25,000. And uh, they were having a, a fine from the European Union of 1 million euros every month because they had no uh, any um, ISO um, uh, certification. So within, uh, one month I wrote that ISO certification, I did all the protocols. So they were already were paying six million pounds out of for six months they were behind schedule. So I did my job and I did even better than the, the director, the head of department that I was working under. They moved me from that office directly to the office of the director of the unit of production because I was uh, working so hard. And uh, I remember I was, I think I was 20, when they inaugurated at the train, I've saved the railway company 6 million euros. And I, I took the, the picture with the, the director, what they call ERDS. ERDS is a group that com comprised all the nuclear power plants, all the um, air buses and all the railway uh, companies. So I took the picture. He came for the inauguration of the train. I was the director, insisted that I was on the picture. If you see yourself the way people are seeing you, then you are already defeated. But if you see yourself the way God sees you, then doors are going to be opened. And people are going to know that you see yourself differently. Whatever they say about you doesn't affect you because you know who you are. They say, oh, you used to be homeless and then who cares? I used to have a friend of mine, uh, Moses. 
He was from uh, Martinique. And uh, he was always saying to me, Grandfather, why did you sell me as a slave? Grandfather, I said, myself, my second name is Mbebe. It's the name of my grandfather who was a slave. So I bear the name of my grandfather who was, who was a slave. I'm a descendant of a slave myself. So why don't you wake up and stop making excuses? You are the new generation. That's what God is saying to the new generation. Your father refused to renew the mind. But I'm speaking to you, the new generation that are going to possess the land. If you don't renew your mind, if you keep on playing the victim, if you are full of hatred, and they are vengeful, that's why God said vengeance is mine. It's not for you to go take it because people did you wrong and then you want to take matters into your own hand. That's not the way of God. Hallelujah. My prayer is that you are going to renew your mind. You are not going to live in hatred. If you do not forgive, hallelujah, you are the one that is in prison. And you are the one that is being tortured. And God can't use you that way, full of hatred and unforgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, from verse 22 to verse 35, Matthew chapter 18, from verse 22 to verse 35, I want to read it, but I will paraphrase it. A king had a servant that owed him 10,000 talents of gold. He could not pay. So the king said, let him be sold as a slave, him and his wife and children. He begged, have mercy on me. So the king just had mercy on him and forgave him all his debts. But as he came out of the palace, he saw a fellow servant that owed him hundred, only a hundred denarii. 10,000 talents of gold is the equivalent of a four billion pounds. A hundred denarii is the equivalent of a 3,000 pounds. And he choked his neighbor. Pay me my money. And say, have mercy on me. The same word he said to the king, his fellow servant said to him as well. But he refused. You've been forgiven four billion uh, pounds and you can't forgive your fellow 3,000 pounds. The truth is many of us think that we've not been forgiven much. That's why we are still holding uh, grudges, hatred and unforgiveness and bitterness. We are trying to justify our anger our unforgiveness. God, don't you remember 430 years of slavery in Egypt? God says, you, you know how much it cost me to deliver you. It cost me the life of my only begotten son, Jesus. So what are you comparing? 3,000 euros or pounds compared to 4 billion? That even if you work 12 hours a shift every day for a thousand years, you are never going to pay me back that money. So I forgave you all your sins. To so you also, I want you to forgive. And because he did not forgive, the, uh, the king said, throw that the servant, that evicted the servant into prison. And they would torture him. The truth is when you are living in unforgiveness, you are the one torturing yourself. The other person does not even uh, care about what you are going for. They've forgotten completely what they did to you. My cousins shot my mom. So my mom will die. So my younger brother was still at home. He was 16. I was already out of the country. So it truly affected my younger brother. It affected all of us, but we already were abroad. So he felt like nobody loved us. And yeah, and if, you know, of, of course, nobody loved us. If someone, if your cousin takes a gun and shot, shoots your, your, your mother to kill her, so you know that they don't love you. So he may have his uh, suspicions in the past, but now you know that they don't love you. So he was full of bitterness, uh, full of anger, of unforgiveness. I was full of uh, anger and some bitterness, but God dealt with that. And God came and told my younger brother, I can't use you that way. You are full of bitterness. I can't. You need to forgive. So God started to help him to forgive and to heal of that bitterness. Because the symbol of the Holy Spirit is a dove. And the dove does not have a bile. 
to those who know bitterness in the Holy Spirit. If you are unforgiving, if you are full of hatred, even if you can, you want to justify your hatred, God can't use you. And you are the one that is being tortured. Whenever you think about the I, what they did to me, the pain comes back, rehearsing the past. May God have mercy on us in Jesus' name. So, we do not justify our hatred. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 15, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 15, the Bible says, uh, do, uh, do not marvel, uh, my brethren, that the world hates you. The world hates us, so that's normal. If they want to kill you, kill your mother, that's normal for them to hate because Satan is behind uh, uh, and influencing the world. So we, it is not a strange thing to us. We know that we have passed from death to life. So if you are still full of uh, hatred and unforgiveness, you are still spiritually dead because we love the brethren. He who does not love the, the brethren, he abides in death. That's why I say if you see full of unforgiveness and of hatred, you are still spiritually dead. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. So that is the standard. If you hate your brother, but God, don't you know what they did to me? I was the slaves. They tried to kill me. You are a murderer, according to God. So that's why you need to read our Bible so that uh, you see how serious those things are. And if you are unforgiving, you are not going to enter heaven. That Matthew chapter 18, 22 to 35, that servant that could not forgive his fellow servant, he was uh, kicked out of uh, the kingdom, and arrested, put in prison, tortured. Like people are going to be tortured and tormented in hell. If you don't forgive, the Lord's prayer, if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. You are still abiding in uh, death, not in life. So don't live in unforgiveness. So he says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And uh, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So no murderer has eternal life uh, abiding in him. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 to verse 21, the Bible says, if someone says he loves God, oh, I love God, I love God, or, uh, but he hates his brother or his sister, he's a liar. He is a liar, for he does not uh, uh, love his brother when, uh, so for, for, sorry, for he who does not love his brother whom he sees, how can he love God whom he does not see? You are a liar. And then this command we have received, it's not a suggestion, this commandment we have from him that uh, he who loves God must, not a suggestion, not may, no, must also love his uh, brother. Otherwise, we are abiding in uh, death and not in eternal life. And John, First John chapter 4, verse 8, First John chapter 4, verse 8 says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Truly, when you are still hating and forgiving, well, you don't know God. You don't know how much God has forgiven you. Like that servant that was forgiven 10,000 uh, talents, 4 billion pounds, and he could not forgive 100 uh, denarii, which is about 3,000 pounds. We simply don't know God. I pray that we are going to know God uh, in the name of uh, Jesus. And then number four, lay the past to rest. Number four, God wants you to lay the past to rest. Forget the things that are behind. You are not suffering from amnesia, but you lay to rest. When the people crossed the Red Sea, it was, there was a purpose for which uh, they had to cross the Red Sea. It is called the Red Sea of forgetfulness. Uh, Micah, Chapter 7, verse 19, he says, I will, tur I will uh, turn again. I will have compassion upon us. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our um, iniquities and uh, you will cast 
all our all the sins into the depths of the sea. Now that's uh, the King James version, but the word sea here is the sea of forgetfulness. So God, when they cross the Red Sea, to the, the symbolism of baptism as well. So God washed away all the sins, buried those sins, uh, iniquities in the Red Sea. Uh, for, and God wanted them to forget it. As far as the east, Psalm 103, as far as the east from the west, those far the Lord has scattered our transgressions uh, away. And he will remember them no more. He wants you to forget them as well. So stop sitting there and meditating. Oh, God, I'm not worthy. I've committed uh, 10 abortions. Oh, I'm not worthy. I used to be a drunkard. Have you confessed them? Yes. If you've confessed them, then move on. Lay the, that past to rest. Forget those things that are behind. It is drowned in the Red Sea of uh, forgetfulness. Your enemies also are used to torment you and oppress you. God also drowned the Egyptians in that Red Sea of forgetfulness. It is now your choice. Many of us, uh, we are still uh, being haunted by our past. We are afraid of our shadow. Those Egyptians that you, so you shall see them no more. They've been drowned in the Red Sea. Why are you afraid? Why don't you want to move forward? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, 18 to 19. Isaiah 43, verse 18 to verse 19. He says, do not remember the former thing. No, do not. Beat your iniquities or the pain of the slavery, the atrocities, the rape. Nobody's making a light of uh, your trauma. God is not. But if you want to move forward in life, you will need to lay it to rest. You will need to let it drown in the Red Sea of forgetfulness and not remember those former, former things. Nor consider the things of old. How many times you failed? How many times you disappointed yourself and disappointed the whole family, disappointed the church? Do not consider those former things. How many times you failed in business? Do not consider those former things. Behold, I will do a new thing. If you don't close the chapter of yesterday, you cannot see the new things that God is doing. If you don't let go of the hatred, the bitterness, and the unforgiveness, you cannot see the promised land flowing with milk and honey. If you don't leave your father's house, like Abraham, you have to even physically leave, emotionally leave, but you can go into a land that the Lord is going to show you. So God says, I'm doing a new thing. And it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? The reason why we don't know it is because we are so caught up in our past. In our regrets, about our failures, about our mistakes, seeing ourselves as grasshoppers, our, as victims, I will make a new thing. And even, I will even make a road in the, a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He led them in the wilderness to enter into that promised land. And Paul also is telling us, Paul used to be a murderer, used to persecute the church, so he did not feel like he was even worthy uh, preaching this gospel. And many times you're not going to feel worthy of uh, preaching the gospel to anybody. You may feel like Paul, that the chiefest of all sinners, and Brother Jerry used to be the chiefest of all sinners. So Paul is telling us his secret as well. He does not remember the former things. Reach out not into your past, but reach out into your future. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 16. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 16. He says, brethren, okay? I do not count myself to have apprehended or to have arrived. No, no one has arrived yet. So it's a work in progress, transformation. But one thing I do, I don't visit my past. I don't dwell in the past. I've laid that to rest. I don't reach out for the past. I'm trying to reach out for the future based on the decisions that I'm taking right now. So one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I'm purposefully forgetting them. And I'm reaching forward, not backward into my past. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead in my future. It has a bright future for me. I press towards the goal 
of the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, only baby in Christ are still dwelling in the past and forgiving, in hatred, in bitterness. But when we mature, we leave those things behind. We know that we cannot go on with God into our destiny if we are still holding on to the past and on to our failures. So as many as are mature, and that's what I want each one of us to be, mature. We've not arrived yet onto perfection, but we are still pressing forward. So let us have a, this mind. And if in anything, we think otherwise. If some people say, no, Jerry, I'd want to remain in unforgiveness. I want to remain in hatred. I want to remain in bitterness. I can't forgive. I can't forgive my mother-in-law. You don't know her. If you're thinking otherwise, well, God will reveal even this to you. But you would have wasted 40 years in the wilderness. Nevertheless, to the degree. So we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. To the degree that we have already attained today, let us walk in the same road. All of us, let us walk in unforgive, in forgiveness, in peace, in love. And let us uh, be of the same uh, mind. So we are reaching out uh, to the future, not into the past. And my prayer is, that we are going to stop the pointing of the finger. One of the things that God said to them when they were fasting, and he's saying to us also when we are fasting, it is in Revel Isaiah chapter 58, verse 8 to verse 9. Actually, we should put 9 to 8, because they've given the condition in 9, but the blessing in 8. And God is saying, when you are going to remove the pointing of the finger, blaming the, uh, the blame game, you are the victim, and the, it is always other people's fault. If you don't examine your own life, people have the part to play in what happened to you, yes. But you need also to examine your own life. Stop the pointing of the fingers. God is on your side. And the one you are going to take full responsibility, that if God is with you, who can be against you? He has opened a door for you that no one can shut. He's going to even make a way in the wilderness, a road in the... In the in the desert, part the Red Sea for you, drown those Egyptians in the Red Sea of forgetfulness. We shall see them no more. So don't be dismayed, intimidated by your future and by your enemies. But remove the pointing of the finger. It says, then your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing, even your healing, you are blaming the pastor. Why don't you also pray yourself? Your healing also shall spring forth speedily. You cannot blame the, 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 I don't blame anybody. I don't. I take responsibility. Your healing also shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be even your rear guard. That's why the pillar of the fire was following them and they had a uh, wall of fire around them in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Then, you shall call upon the Lord, then he will answer you. Hallelujah. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. The condition is this. If you take away the yoke from the midst, so you stop oppressing other people the way you are oppressed. Many people, because they were oppressed, they want to oppress other people. No. And if you also, you take away the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. So stop the pointing of the finger. Stop repaying people evil for evil. Stop speaking in wickedness also or doing wicked things to people. But take responsibility. Then your light is going to spring forth in the name of Jesus. Healing is going also to come speedily. God is going to, the glory of the Lord is going to radiate all around you. And everything that you are going to lay your hands upon to do shall prosper in Jesus' precious name. I mean, I've not finished this secret. There are so many things, but I wanted to lay this foundation because as you think in your heart, so it is going to be. So I want you to, as you go back home, you already in your home, examine yourself. Am I still uh, in unforgiveness? Who have I not forgiven because of what they've done to me in my past? 
Do I still have bitterness in me? Do I still see myself as a victim? Do I still define myself like a grasshopper? Examine yourselves. And may God speak to you. And may you let go of the past, lay it to rest. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. What you say to our brethren, the Jews, it helped them truly to rebuild. They were able to build the nation of Israel. It was destroyed again. They came back in the days of Zerubbabel with the same kind of principle. They rebuilt. They did not play the victim. It was destroyed. They were scattered. 2,000 years later, they came back in 1946. They rebuilt again. They've never played a victim, though they were victims, but they never saw themselves as a victim because you forbade them to see themselves as a victim. No, we are not victims, we are victors because you always lead us into triumph and through us you diffuse the fragrance of your knowledge. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Even when we are being killed, the poor say all day long we are counted as a sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We only say we are more than conquerors. We don't read what this, even we've been into those uh, concentration camps and many of the children, Jewish children that were in Auschwitz and uh, they landed in uh, America as uh, uh, refugees from the uh, Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. They were 12 years old. Many have gone to become multi-billionaires. They have uh, chains of pharmacies and computers, uh, uh, industries. Many have become multi-billionaires from uh, victims of the Holocaust and from the camp of uh, Auschwitz. They came without the parents because the parents were cremated in those uh, uh, crematoria. They were refugees, uh, children of 12 years old, 10 years old in America when they landed. But because they understood what God said, and they were taught in the synagogue, no, you've gone through that atrocity. But God is not seeing you as victims. And uh, your past, that Holocaust even does not define what I'm going to do for you. And you've done great things for the Jews. And Father, I pray that we are going to renew our mind. So that we don't waste any time anymore to conquer the land that is flowing with milk and honey for each one of us, regardless of our past and our background. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, thank you for your precious time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You need, to turn off, you need to turn off the recording, please. Yes, something is uh, frozen here. I don't know why. <laughs> so, <laughs> it will stop. Okay, okay. God bless. Bye. Bye.